Okay, thank you everybody for joining us. We're gonna get started. I'm Meredith Weissman. I'm the Director of Community Engagement here at Sonoma State. It's a pleasure to introduce you to our faculty presenters for today's event. Uh, please put your questions into the chat as we go and we will uh, circle back to those um, when the talks are done. And please join me in thanking and welcoming Dr. Bittner and Dr. Baker. Doc? Dr. Bittner, you're first. Okay, so bear with me for a second here while I, I share my screen. Okay, um, so, uh, well, first of all, thank you, Merith, for, for organizing this event um, and, um, uh, and to Zeke for agreeing to participate in it. And, and I know that Zeke would reject the label of an Eastern Europeanist, but it, it's been a real joy for me to discover that I'm not the only faculty member at SSU with a scholarly interest in Russia, Ukraine, and the, the former Soviet Union. Uh, and, and our talk today is, is a small part of a, of a much broader wave of teach-ins occurring at universities across Europe and North America. And, and we're all struggling to make sense of the most serious threat to European peace and stability since 1945, and, and perhaps humanity's most serious brush with nuclear warfare since 1962. And, and we meet at a moment where the way forward to peace is still unclear the status quo, quo ante, which is just two weeks and one day in the past, seems like a different world entirely. And so for those most pressing of questions, what will happen next? What should we do? How does this crisis end without the deaths of tens of thousands and the entrenchment of hatreds that will last generations? I, I really have no good answers. In fact, you'll see that I'm a bit of a pessimist about the future, uh, but I do have many friends and colleagues in both Russia and Ukraine whose lives and livelihoods have been torn apart by the war. So I, I hope it soon ends and I hope we, we find a way forward toward peace. And I wanna start by acknowledging that I am a bit of a scholarly imperialist when it comes to Ukraine. I know Ukraine via Russia, which is my principal focus as scholar and professor. I, I first encountered Ukraine in the fall of 1992 when I was a 22 year old exchange student living in Moscow. And at that time, less than a year after the collapse of communism, there still was no border control between Russia and Ukraine. It was far different from the border I encountered in the summer of 2016 the last time I rode the train from Moscow to Kiev. At Sumy, a city on the Ukrainian side of the border now besieged by Russian artillery, dogs came aboard the train to sniff for weapons being smuggled to the separatists in Donetsk and Lugansk. And I was the only non-Russian, non-Ukrainian on board. And so when the Ukrainian immigration officer saw my American passport, she yelled out to her colleagues, Nashla Yevo, I found him. Uh, now, despite my professional pedigree as a Russianist, I've spent a good deal of time in recent years doing archival research in Ukraine, in Kiev and Odessa especially, but also in Simferopol and Yalta in Crimea. Uh, in fact, when Russia annexed Crimea in 2014, the news media quickly anointed me a Crimean expert, simply by virtue of the fact that I mentioned on my SSU website that I had done research in Crimea. Um, and I was there because much of southern Ukraine and Crimea, the Black Sea literal, uh, were the Soviet Union's main vinicultural territories. And, and I needed Ukrainian archives to complete a book on the history of czarist and Soviet era winemaking, which was published last year. And in an Anglophone world that was mostly oblivious to Crimea's existence, I had my 15 minute, minutes of Warholian fame in 2014. And today, fortunately, there are far more and better experts on, on Ukraine. So I wanna be a, a bit of a provocateur in my brief talk today to, to argue on behalf of three points that may not be self-evident, but that I believe help explain the present crisis. And so my, my first point 
is that Ukraine can in many ways be understood as the principal loser of the First World War. And the idea of a Ukrainian nation, that is the idea that there existed a people bound by a shared Ukrainian identity, dates from the first half of the 19th century. The Ukrainian national idea can be found in the writings of Tara Shevchenko, Ukraine's most beloved poet. The Ukrainian national idea was further refined by students and faculty members at St. Vladimir University in Kiev. And there, intellectuals devoted themselves to Cossack traditions in Ukrainian language as something distinct from Russian. In folk culture, they believed, lay the authentic national soul. But, but in the beginning of the 19th century, there was no political entity called Ukraine. And while there was a Ukrainian national idea, it was largely an intellectual construct that was limited to the coffee house class. The people to whom this new Ukrainian identity was as, as, uh, ascribed were mostly peasants. And they lived in two empires. In the Russian Empire, which disparagingly referred to Ukraine as Mala Russia, Little Russia, and in the Habsburg Empire, which used the East Slavic catch all term Ruthenian to refer to Ukrainians. And, and this much is standard. It's a story of national awakening of the birth of a nation, which characterized much of Eastern Europe in the 19th century. In Eastern Europe, especially imperial maps of the Ottoman Tsarist and Habsburgian empires hid the existence of nations, at least in the view of nationalists who saw it as their lives calling to struggle for independence. Yet here, Ukrainian nationalism diverges from the Eastern European pattern. Whereas the First World War summoned into existence nation states in Eastern Europe, in large part because two very different persons, Woodrow Wilson and Vladimir Lenin, held similar views about the importance of national self-determination, Ukraine did not achieve independence. The Ukrainian Rada, its parliament, declared independence from Russia in 1917. It precipitated a crisis that helped usher in the collapse of the liberal provisional government in St. Petersburg and the Bolshevik victory in October. But Ukrainian independence was short-lived. By the end of the Russian Civil War in 1920, U Ukraine had been reincorporated into a new sort of imperial entity the Soviet Union, where it would remain until 1991. The Soviet Union was national in form, as the saying went, but it was socialist in content. It was thus imperial in its organization, but not imperial in its substance, because imperialism, in Lenin's formulation, was the highest stage of capitalism. A socialist state could never be imperial. And my point here is that Ukraine is peculiar in the Eastern European context in that its nationalist movement did not realize dreams of independence in 1918. Even in defeated Germany, the end of war brought republicanism and democracy. The Ukrainian defeat in World War I was far more thorough. Okay, so my second provocative point is that the Soviet Union both cultivated and persecuted Ukrainian identity. And one of the most common misperceptions about the Soviet Union is that it was a prison of nations, that it diligently crushed the centrifugal forces of nationalism wherever they appeared. To the contrary, the Soviet Union granted limited forms of nationhood to its non-Russian minority populations. This included the right to use and be educated within a national language, the right to a national culture, the right to benefit from affirmative action programs for non-Russian national minorities, and the right to be ruled by a national administrative elite. Now, obviously the Soviet Union made these concessions to nationalists while denying one fundamental right, the right to self-determination there was no path to secession from the Soviet Union. 
Nonetheless, it, it's wrong to think that the transnational Soviet identity, Homo Sovieticus, was simply a Russian invention or a stand-in for Russianness. As my car colleague at Carleton University in Canada, Jeff Saadeo, has shown in a study of Soviet-era migrants to Moscow from Central Asia, Sovietness was a deeply held sincere identity, even among the Soviet Union's Muslim peoples. In 1991, nearly three quarters of Ukrainians voted for the so-called Union Treaty, which would have refashioned the Soviet Union into a voluntary confederation of fully sovereign states. The Baltic Republics, to the contrary, refused to participate in the referendum. So intense was their feeling of national subjugation. But at the same time, there were forms of Ukrainian nationalism that the Soviet state could not tolerate. When peasants in Ukraine resisted the collectivization of agriculture in the early 1930s, Joseph Stalin interpreted their hostility to Soviet power as capitalist sabotage driven by inveterate Ukrainian nationalists. Three to four million peasants died in the ensuing famine in 1932 and 33, when the Soviet state forcibly seized grain in the Ukrainian countryside. And then during the Second World War, many Ukrainians welcomed the Wehrmacht with bread and salt, the traditional Slavic sign of hospitality. A smaller number of Ukrainians, led by Stepan Bandera, fought alongside the Germans and collaborated with German efforts to exterminate Ukrainian Jews. Even in the late 1940s and early 50s, Bandera's organization of Ukrainian nationalists fought a costly CIA-subsidized insurrection against the Red Army in Western Ukraine, territories that the Soviet Union had annexed from Poland in 1945. Nearly 50,000 Red Army soldiers died before the insurrection was put down. Bandera himself eventually settled in Munich, where he was assassinated by the KGB in the early 1970s. Now, to some Ukrainians, Bandera remains a national hero who fought for Ukraine's liberation from the Soviet Union. The red and black flags of the Banderite movement are present at nearly every Ukrainian national demonstration. In the wake of the Euromaidan protests in 2014, Ukraine threw open the doors to its KGB archive to researchers, in large part to embarrass Russia, which had retaliated for Euromaidan by annexing Crimea and funding a separatist movement in the East. In the KGB materials show how profound the Soviet concern with Ukrainian nationalism remained even in the 1970s and 80s. Virtually every university, especially in Kiev and Kharkov, and Kharkov is way in the east, had become hotbeds for anti-Soviet Ukrainian nationalist sentiment, particularly among students. Now, my, my final provocative point uh, that, that I want to argue is that language is a very poor indicator of national identity in present day Ukraine. In two weeks ago, before the beginning of hostilities, the press led us to believe that invading Russian soldiers would be greeted with bread and salt in Eastern Ukraine. And there, in so-called left bank Ukraine, the Russian language remains predominant. However, the bravery of local populations in Eastern Ukraine, the vast majority of whom are Russian speakers, in resisting Russian forces reveals what Ukrainians have long known to be true. Ukraine is de facto a bilingual state where one national identity accommodates two commonly spoken languages that are separated by about a thousand years of divergent evolution. While all Ukrainian children receive instruction in Ukrainian, uh, many go home to Russian speaking households. Or in the case of Odessa and Kharkov, they exit schools onto Russian speaking streets. And even Kiev today remains a largely Russian speaking city 
Waiters and shop clerks may address customers first in Ukrainian, but they will happily switch to Russian if necessary. Menus are often in Ukrainian on one side and in Russian or English on the other. In the main federal archive in Kiev, where all signage is in Ukrainian, researchers and archivists communicate with each other mostly in Russian. Most archival documentation, not surprisingly, is in the language of the old imperial hegemon, Russian. And when Russia annexed Crimea in 2014, Ukraine lost its most intransigently Russian population. Because of its special history and because of the Russian military presence in Crimea, which was negotiated by treaty after Ukrainian independence in 1991, the majority of Crimeans understood themselves to be Russian, a fact that Russia recognized by granting passports to Crimeans beginning in 2008. In 2014 and 15, it was common to see in Moscow billboards proclaiming Krim Nash, Crimea is ours. But the flip side of Krim Nash was a diminished Ukraine that was decidedly more Ukrainian. Even the populations of Donetsk and Lugansk, sites of separatist fighting, are not so much Russian as they are Soviet, since people from across the Soviet Union move there to work in the coal mines. In the existence of a widely shared Ukrainian identity that crosses language lines appears to have caught Vladimir Putin by surprise. The power of Ukrainian civic and national identity represents Russia's biggest military challenge. It also suggests that the war ahead will be brutal and long because there is no significant component of the Ukrainian population that has indicated a willingness to collaborate with Russian forces in wartime and post-war governance. Putin has repeatedly said that Russians and Ukrainians are one people and that Russia invaded Ukraine to free its Ukrainian brothers from the tyranny of, quote, drug-addled Nazis. But no one in Ukraine has so far indicated a desire to be liberated. In short, it seems to me that Russia is at war with an idea of Ukrainianness that is almost universally held. It, and it seems to me that that's a hard war to win without massive brutality. Fear may be the only weapon in the Russian arsenal powerful enough to destroy an idea. Okay, I will stop there and turn the screen over to Zeke. Thank you, Steve. So, um, thanks, Steve. Um, hopefully, this will sort of dovetail uh, um, in interesting ways off of your presentation. Um, so, a little bit of our context um, of, of myself, in addition to what Merit stated at the beginning. Um, I grew up in Ukraine as an American citizen from uh, around 1995 until 2005. And so my standpoint is, is a bit different um, and this doesn't necessarily align um, from, with, with my research as a sociologist. So um, I would say that my standpoint um, on this, this conflict is really from the perspective of the early 2000s, um, a period around the time um, of what was called the Orange Revolution, which I'll speak about in a moment. Um, so I come at this from the standpoint of, uh, of the Orange Revolution, which is um, a sort of populist and pro-democracy set of protests in Kiev um, in, in uh, 2004, 2005. Um, and so that's a little bit of a different standpoint, um, but that's, that's where I'm at and, and that will feature uh, in my story. So I'd like to put the Ukraine uh, crisis in sociological perspective and I'll pick up with the historical narrative um, really at the time of the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, and then I'll shift towards looking at uh, the relationship, the sort of frictions between state and society, both in Ukraine and in Russia, that um, lead me also to a position of pessimism regarding this conflict. Okay, so um, let me just give a sort of basic timeline of recent Ukrainian history. 
So we get it to the end of 1991, the dissolution of the Soviet Union or the USSR, um, and a referendum which established uh, Ukrainian independence. Um, sort of jumping ahead to 2004, there's an election scandal which leads to what is called what was called the Orange Revolution. These were street protests for the dismissal of, um, on the basis of election fraud, the dismissal of uh, Viktor Yanukovych and um, and also jumbled in with their uh, pleas for um, political reforms of all sorts and a range of other concerns. Um, the, the opposition to Yanukovych, Viktor Yushchenko, ultimately wins. Um, this is a point at which um, Ukrainian civil society, Ukrainian nationalism starts to enter uh, politics in, in ways that um, have not turned back since, um, I would argue. Um, in 2010, amid sort of, uh, sort of political fragmentation across uh, a range of political parties and economic stagnation, um, Yanukovych, who had originally been sort of deposed, uh, and his party of regions win the presidential election. In 2013, uh, under clear uh, pressure from Vladimir Putin, Yanukovych failed to sign what he had initially promised as a Ukraine-European Union Association Agreement that, that would have sort of carved a more straight path towards EU membership. Uh, immediately, or, or quite soon thereafter, in the winter of 2013 to 2014, therefore, there was an, another um, popular revolution with, with huge numbers of protesters in the hundreds of thousands. Um, in 2013-2014 called the Revolution of Dignity among Ukrainians or um, in the West often and, and in Ukraine as well often understood as Euromaidan protests. Unlike the Orange Revolution uh, a decade prior, the Euromaidan protests were, were bloody. They involved uh, over 100 dead protesters and, and 30 or so dead police officers. It was after um, these circumstances that Viktor Yanukovych um, fled up and up and fled to Russia, which Putin was not happy about um, and left uh, a political crisis in its wake in Ukraine. Um, it was around this time that the Russian Federation occupied and annexed Crimea. Um, and the beginning, it was also after this time that you have the beginning of civil conflict uh, featuring Russian backed insurgents in the Donbass region in Eastern Ukraine, the Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast, which has been uh, at war in, in, in civil war um, since that time. And, and around 13,000 people have died in that conflict. Uh, many of them have been civilians. Um, I'll simply point out that that sort of nationalist streak in Ukrainian politics has, has remained over, the, over, the, over this period. So in 2015, for example, uh, Ukrainian parliament, the Vakhovna uh, Rada, and um, then President Petro Poroshenko uh, passed uh, a series of decommunization, what are called decommunization laws, um, that have resulted in uh, the removal of, of Soviet Union era references uh, really across, across the country. In 2019, the current president, President uh, Zelensky, was, was elected in a landslide victory. Around this time, the constitution, or shortly thereafter, the constitution was amended in Ukraine that deepened Ukraine's trajectory towards both EU, uh, specifically EU membership, but also um, NATO participation in NATO. So um, it was in January 2022, of course, that the Russian Federation recognized these breakaway separatist republics, Donetsk, or, or regions, Donetsk and Luhansk as autonomous republics, and shortly thereafter the invasion began. Um, let me jump to Russia and we'll end with the, we will end at that same endpoint uh, of last month um, in, in, with the invasion. Okay, so in, in Russia, we get sort of, and I'll show some figures after this, this brief history that kind of situates some of this. Um, we get a sort of major economic downturn in Russia uh, under Boris Yeltsin. The, the, the Chechen wars are fought in the mid 1990s and the late 1990s. And is, it is out of these wars that uh, Putin um, emerges. Uh, I mean, he'd been involved in Russian military and politics for, for a while. 
um, but was elected president for the first time in 2020 and has been president or, um, or prime minister uh, since that period. So it's in 2007, 2008, um, also in the midst of, a, 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 I, I would say, a comparable and very important parallel to what's going on in Ukraine, what happened in Georgia, um, a war that featured separatist regions um, and Russian military action uh, in light of uh, also a parallel set of early 2000 popular uh, movements in Georgia around NATO and around the EU. It's around this Georgia-Russian war that um, Putin becomes very clear, along with uh, Medvedev, who had been president and was also prime minister, uh, that Russia will not accept, it will be policy for Russia not to accept NATO expansion in Eastern Europe. I'll show some maps that, that, that sort of depict that concern shortly. Um, there is unrest in Russia to, to an unprecedented, um, still not super widespread degree in 2011, 2012, a series of protests, um, protests around election uh, or election fraud, protests for democratic rights. Uh, opposition leaders are promptly uh, repressed. Alexei Navalny, uh, most prominent among them. Um, it is after this time that Russia annexes Crimea, continues to repress civil society, including enacting what are called foreign agent laws that um, severely uh, restrict, name, shame, and uh, punish independent media and journalists. Um, I put in this July 2021 reference uh, amid the pandemic. Uh, Putin spent a lot of time sort of away from others. One of the things that he was doing was, was studying history, and he writes on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians which is both this sort of streaming historical revisionist narrative of Russia and Ukraine, as well as sort of some hints at foreign policy that align with, um, with what's going on in Ukraine right now. So let me just show a few, a few figures and then get at, at, at some of the tensions I see between state and society in both of these locations. So this is the former Soviet bloc. Um, uh, it's the, the current Russian Federation. And these are these are sort of some of these are Warsaw Pact countries, but they're um, this is sort of the, the, the former um, Soviet sphere of influence. Um, NATO, no surprise, uh, has expanded since its origins um, after World War II, and and has included uh, Warsaw Pact countries. Um, this is what uh, Putin is, is is concerned about. Um, there's a bit of some context that is I'm going to breeze over, but is that but is important, which is namely to see, namely that there's sort of major economic turbulence both in the Russian Federation and in Ukraine. So I, this is sort of uh, a map of GDP, annual GDP growth of the of the Ukraine, Russia, and the United States. I put the United States on here really as a reference point, sort of because we know about um, sort of changing economy economic circumstances in the US. Here's a sort of major declines in the 1990s, followed by um, recovery and, and, and significant uh, drops in the financial crisis. And what's important here is that, that people and government sort of uh, tell different stories about the post-Soviet, um, what's going on in post-Soviet society in relation to some of these turbulent changes, um, including, for example, what's up with oligarchs. Um, so, so for example, here's a demonstration of the, the top 1%. Um, again, with some, some comparison here, I don't have the Ukrainian uh, data here, but this is sort of a trend line um, going up and up and up of the share of total income going to the 1%, um, sort of a, a bit of a code for, um, the ultra rich in, in Russia. I'm skip over that. Okay, so um, now I kind of want to tell this story in a bit of a different way, which which shows the the way in which state or government has related uh, distinctly, that is to say, differently in Ukraine and Russia, and how I think this will make for a a very difficult road ahead within this conflict because of how these societies have related to their governments. So we'll start with Ukraine and then go to Russia and finally I'll finish with some conclusions. Okay, so um, this is an election map of 1994, the sort of final election of, of uh, Leonid Kuchma, uh, 
um, versus Kravchuk. Um, Kuchma won uh, this, this election and, and, and served two terms. Um, sort of this, you could sort of imagine this as a kind of uh, depiction of political polarization of sort of um, East versus West. And to, to an extent, at least on the election map, that's true. And that held um, for some time. This is, this is the 2004 election after the Orange Revolution that has Yushchenko winning. It very much is an East-West story. But I would caution against suggesting that this is a pro-Western versus anti-Russian story. Um, so public opinion polls in Ukraine in 2009 show that most Ukrainians still look at Russia as sort of having a positive influence on Ukraine. Um, uh, and, and this relates to sort of public opinion also around sort of economic ties uh, in addition to cultural ties and familial ties and the rest of it. Um, and what political, what, what, what politics has really been about, I would argue, has to do with, sort of, has to do with views about democracy. So um, what's often been called a sort of democracy gap in Ukrainian politics is quite clear. This is also data from, from 2009, where it's very important to Ukrainians to have a fair judiciary, to have uh, a free media, to have multi-party elections, but their evaluations of, of those circumstances are, suggest that they are very poor. So there's this gap between um, aspirations and reality. Um, and this carries, this carries itself into um, how Ukrainian politics get fragmented, eventually Yanukovych, as I indicated, wins in 2010, but again, doesn't win simply because he is more pro-Russian or, or speaking for a, sub, a, a subset of the Ukrainian population that somehow wants to be with, with Russia. So for example, here's data from 2014 among Ukrainians in the Eastern regions, um, who, who clearly oppose unification, at least, um, with Russia. This is Luhansk and Donetsk um, that, that separated around this time. And certainly the surrounding oblasts show that they oppose unification with Russia. So what does this, what does this mean? What does this ultimately then mean for, for Ukrainian politics? Um, well, Again, I would argue it has to do with this sort of democracy gap. So this is going to be really hard to make. Um, to, it's not going to be so legible. I apologize for that. But these are three figures that show that Ukrainians have very low confidence in their government. Ukraine is this clean green line here in comparison to global averages and post-Soviet Eurasian um, sort of, uh, countries. Uh, very um, poor trust in elections and a high level and growing level of concern for corruption in government and business. This is, um, this is data up till 2018. So this is a situation that is ripe for the rise of populism. It is ripe for the rise of, of uh, someone who can pull together an anti-corruptionist and nationalist agenda, which is why, which is part of to cut the story short, why Zelensky wins most districts across Ukraine in the 2019 election, and why it is, I would argue, that the that the Ukrainian population is likely to back Zelensky and his government uh, through this conflict. So Russian state society relations are quite different. Um, and have a different endpoint that have some that have some correspondence between what society thinks and and what Putin is doing, and that is very much in conflict between the sort of Zelensky kind of consensus um, in Ukraine, and and that's troublesome. So so for example, this is this is quite striking. This is Vladimir Putin's uh, sort of over his political career. Um, he's very popular. Uh, do you approve of the activities of Vladimir Putin? Notice here, um, after the annex of, annexation of Crimea, a sort of major leap in, um, in his approval ratings among the uh, Russian population. Um, Ukraine, Russians think that Russia should remain a superpower uh, that has grown. This is longitudinal data, um, public opinion data that shows its role as a superpower should be maintained, that that figure is growing. Um, 
another figure that has grown substantially since the fall of the Soviet Union is the share of Russian people who think that, quote, Russia is a great people who have a special place in world history that articulates with um, Putin's ideology uh, quite, quite closely. Um, returning Crimea to the Russian Federation is ranked very high in terms of the events and phenomena that Russian people um, are proud of. Um, only above that is the country's leading, leading role in space exploration and victory in what's called the Great uh, Patriotic War or the World War II. Um, there's a different story about the view of Ukrainians um, in, in, in Russia, and that is that they've that has shifted over time towards, so uh, this is um, the, the good and the bad, the light blue line is a, is a reflects a sort of poor evaluations of Ukrainians. Um, and so after events like uh, the revolution of dignity and the, and the annexation of Crimea, you get a much lower view of Ukrainians among Russians, and that's been quite mixed um, in recent years certainly different than the situation in the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, therefore, the Russian population uh, quite positively has assessed the annexation of Crimea, definitely positive among these respondents. This is a uh, Russian Public Opinion Research Center data that was conducted very recently. Um, just data from uh, a the last couple weeks, um, most this is sorry. Um, this is basically showing an evaluation at the end of February and the beginning of March of how things are going basically with respect to the quote special military operation in Ukraine. Um, that remains uh, evaluated well among the Russian population. The reasoning behind in, in Russian public opinion data from the last couple of weeks also suggests that Russian people do indeed believe that they are protecting the interests of Russia against NATO expansion as a primary reason uh, for Russia's activities. And so um, this leads me to a few, few conclusions. The relationship between state and society are marked by distinct tensions. Um, in both Russia and Ukraine, particularly regarding the legitimacy of their government, um, their, their desire for democracy and to fight for it, and the trajectory of where their respective nations are headed um, uh, towards a Ukrainian nation that is, um, that is towards, towards Europe on the one hand, and a, a, a Russian nation that supports uh, Russian nationalism on the other hand, uh, Russian nationalism, that is to say, including, including Ukraine, or at least including military activities there. Um, so the state society relationship in each country it has been different and has been opposed immediately up to the Russian invasion. And I think that war, of course, the fog of it will reshape the legitimacy of government in each place. Um, but I think it will very durably sharpen uh, rather than reduce how Ukrainians, Russians, and Russian and Ukrainian governments relate to one another. Um, so I have some resources here that I can share in the chat um, with respect to information, as well as a compendium of, of talks in the near term, teach-ins that Steve mentioned earlier, and some, um, some support that you might uh, consider as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bittner and Dr. Baker. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat, and I'm going to uh, read the read one at a time, give you a chance to respond. And and folks, please continue to add your questions, and we will spend the rest of our time on that. Um, so the first question is from um, Ben Smith, and he would like to know. But what's the strategy behind Putin's rhetoric of denazification, and why drug addled? Uh, Zeke, do you want to take that or? You want to go ahead? Okay, well, uh, Ben, good, good question. Um, so it has a couple of different components. Uh, you know, the denazification component speaks to the power of the myth of the Second World War in Russia today. And it's really uh, simply impossible to overstate 
the significance of the Second World War in present day Russian politics. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, you've probably read in recent weeks about the, the laws um, restricting how Russian media can report on the war in Ukraine. Similar laws have been passed in recent years restricting how um, the Russian media um, discusses the Second World War. It, it's actually against the law to defame the heroism um, of the Soviet Union, the Red Army, Red Army soldiers um, in the Second World War. And one of the things um, that Russia has found, or Putin in particular, has found most upsetting in recent years has been um, the uh, movements not only in Ukraine but across the uh, you know the the Soviet Union's Western republics, the Baltic republics, Ukraine, uh, to remove monuments to the war. This was a huge issue in uh, the Baltic republics, Estonia in particular, um, just what about a decade ago. And I'm going to share my screen one more time. Um, bear with me. I'm going to open up a photograph. I, I was going to include it uh, in my slideshow, but but I, I ended up not not including it. So share screen. Okay. So this is an example of a monument that was constructed um, on the site of a monument to liberation by the Red Army that was removed. And, you know, this is in Ukrainian. I don't speak Ukrainian, but this is close enough to Russian that I can make sense of it. It says, we died so that Ukraine could live. And it's a, it's a monument to um, Ukrainians who fought on the side of the Wehrmacht um, uh, in the Second World War, who collaborated with Nazi Germany in the hopes that that would produce Ukrainian freedom at the end of the war. So that, that's the, you know, the, the denazification component. Um, you know, Putin quite simply sees anybody who questions the, the heroism and the centrality of the Soviet Union in the Second World War to be akin to a Nazi. Um, you know, the drug addled bit is, is a bit more, um, uh, you know, why, you know, what accounts for that is, is a bit more uncertain. You know, Putin has often uh, um, presented himself as a defender of traditional family values. It's one of the reasons why, um, you know, the right in America has, um, has embraced Putin. Um, and, and interestingly, in, in much of the, um, the Russian reporting of the special operations, so to speak, in, in Ukraine, um, there have been accounts of, of drug laboratories that um, Russian soldiers have come across. And the one that I, I found most amusing was um, a, a drug laboratory for uh, producing stimulants for urban fighters in Mariupol, uh, which is on the Black Sea. And, and it occurred to me that that drug laboratory could very well be a Nespresso machine. Um, uh, but, but this is, you know, a, a pretty common trope in the way Putin discusses the war. You. The only thing I'll add to just briefly on that, that question of denazification um, is I think that also relates to um, reporting in Russian media on the on sort of outsized uh, reporting on Ukrainian nationalists who, who, who do exist and who have been involved in, um, in popular movements and sort of also sort of have had sort of outsized visibility, especially um, in the revolution of dignity, but there are political parties and are hardline Ukrainian nationalists that um, are do exist in Ukrainian politics and are a sort of easy target for, for Putin as well. Yeah, just uh, I add one more thing here. My, you know, and when that last time I was in Kiev, I had a cafe that was just around the corner from the apartment I rented, and in the coffee I would always order in the morning morning was called a Benderovska. Uh, so it was a, a, a coffee named for Stepan Bandera, um, uh, you know, the greatest of all Ukrainian collaborators. And, and that does suggest that there, there's an, 
there is some ability to differentiate, you know, the, you know, on one hand, you can see Bandera was a fascist, but on the other hand, he, you, you know, he did some things that were good for Ukraine. Um, the, the problem is the Russians have no gray in their view of the Second World War. It's a, a Manichaean vision. So thank you. We have several questions about information and disinformation, and I'm going to combine them a bit. So uh, Rita Primo asks, just says that disinformation seems to be an ongoing issue in terms of news available, particularly regarding what average Americans are seeing on social media. What are your suggestions for navigating the information ecosystem and separating the factual wheat from the chafe? Chaff. And so I'll just... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I'm going to finish up with these others yep. that are related because um, there's there are a couple of others that are that are related to this. So um, there's an article that's that Gail Jonas linked to Zelensky makes peace with neo-Nazi paramilitaries in 2019 um, is reporting like this accurate. And then Tyra Benoit, I'm not sure, Bono. Um, how reliable is the data gathered from VCIOM? So lots of questions about the reliability of information and data. So I thought I would combine those. Um, great. I can take a stab at a few of those sort of in, in backwards order. VCIOM is, uh, so I did dig, I used some of that public opinion data as of recently. I, I would say it's sort of the best that I could find on current, um, on current public opinion. Um, I would say it's less reliable than some of the other data I use from the Lovata Center, um, which is sort of sociological data. Um, this relates to issues of sort of good information and good press. So the Lovata Center, for example, if you sort of go to the bottom, they are sort of pegged as a quote foreign agent um, because some of their straight public opinion data has, has um, has suggested uh, s some problems uh, in, in Putin's regime. Um, and so, so data is very, data information is tightly controlled in Russia. I don't think that's news to anyone. Um, I don't know if we've mentioned, it is, it is important to recognize that the crackdown in information and the repression of the free press has um, been sort of scaled up dramatically since this conflict. Um, so that'll continue to be an issue um, in Russian civil society. Um, and let's see, in terms of in, in, in terms of press reporting in the US, um, I think I, I did provide a few resources that I that I would suggest um, in the chat for for following the conflict. I'd be interested in Steve's perspective on sort of mainstream US US press coverage. And um, I haven't I haven't found it particularly egregiously bad. I, I in, in communicating, I'm communicating with people in Ukraine, all across Ukraine, um, on a very daily basis, and it is it is also definitely the case that what people are hearing and seeing in Ukraine is different than what people are hearing and seeing in Russia, and that's different than what people are hearing and seeing in the U.S. Yeah. So. Um... You know, I, I want to point out that Russia has gone dark. Um, there's very little reporting about the war right now coming out of Russia. You can go, the best Russian newspaper is called Novaya Gazeta, the new, new Gazette. Um, and they have a banner across the top of their website now saying they essentially admitting we're indicate we're limited in what we can report given the, the new laws um, uh, covering uh, war coverage. Um, Medusa has, has gone out of business. Dojd, which was one of the last independent TV stations has gone out of business or at least stopped broadcasting. Um, what's, the, um, what's the one I'm missing, Zeke? There's another big one. It was news to me that Medusa went out of business. Yeah, so Medusa is like... out. Yeah, uh, Medusa has gone silent. Oh, it's Echo Moscow, uh, the radio station, which actually is is one that was one of the pillars of the Glasnost and Perestroika period, um, and and they've just decided that they don't want to try to conform um, to the the new Russian reporting laws. 
Yesterday, um, the New York Times announced that it was withdrawing all its, um, the entirety of its Moscow bureau staff because um, it cannot guarantee their safety. Um, you, you know, uh, since 1945, the New York Times has had a presence in Moscow. And, and so this is really, I think, quite frightening. Um, for the first time in my adult life, uh, probably the, my entire life, the, the U.S. State Department has encouraged Americans to leave Russia if possible. Um, and so things are, are pretty grim there. For Ukraine is better. I mean, it's hard to find sources in English. Zeke put up the, uh, the Kiev Independent um, you know, if you speak, if you are able to read Russian, um, you know, I would encourage you to get on Telegram, um, which is just an invaluable, um, you know, way to communicate with both Russia and Ukraine, but also to read the, um, you know, the kind of news feed there. Um, but but it, but it, it's very difficult, uh, you know, to get good information right now. Um. Thank you. Uh, uh, Kimberly also asked a related question and I missed it, but I uh, are the public opinion polls from Russia regarding the conflict accurate, reliable in your opinion? But I feel like that was answered. So I'm gonna, yes, she says yes, okay. So i um, sorry that I didn't read it off, but glad it got answered. Okay, so, um, and then Kate Sims asked, um, I think this is for you, Zeke, was there a chart regarding Russia's attitude towards democracy? She might have missed it. She saw one for the Ukrainians. Great question. Um, so, I mean, I have looked at some of this data quite recently, and the only thing that I'll say is that concern around freedom of the press and assembly, um, concern around um, Putin's political party having outsized influence are, are lower on the sort of hierarchy of concerns. So above that is, is things like security um, and then also sort of other social grievances like better health care and so on and so forth. So um, I haven't looked at direct measures, sort of, you know, an index of, of you know, democratic ideals or something like that, um, which I should. Um, but but it's not it's not the sort of it's not sort of yearning for democracy in the in the Russian population or something like that. Um, there's a lot more questions and only a few more minutes, so I'm going to ask people not to feel poorly if I skip you because I want to combine the ones that are related. So I'm sorry. Um, I am asking. Uh, there's a few questions about China. Uh, Juliet says, I'm curious about the effect that the war will have on China and its relationship with Western power. Um, and uh, and uh, there's more on that. Could Putin's invasion be a motivation for China to possibly invi invade Taiwan? Will China discard the security the US has guaranteed to Taiwan because of the obvious lack of help we're giving to Ukraine? How likely is it that China and Russia will become formal allies against NATO since China seems to be Putin's only source of shared autocratic worldview at this time. Um, and I think that this last question from John is related. I heard an interview with Masha Gessen this morning stating that Russian journalists and others are emigrating, fearing the new Iron Curtain. Actually, maybe not. Maybe that's more related to the sociological consequences of Ukraine. I'm not sure. But I'll pass that off to you. Mm. Well, I mean, first on the, uh, you know, China and Russia versus NATO, I do want to point out NATO is a European, is, you know, part of the framework for European security. And so China would, would fall outside of that. And, you know, there are some other um, um, NATO members, the, you know, the French and the British who operate in the Pacific. Uh, you know, they have a military presence in the Pacific, Pacific but nothing like, uh, you know, what the Americans have. And, you know, there is some evidence, uh, of course, we remember during the Olympics, the, um, you know, the meeting between Putin and the Chinese president, where they, they said there were no limits on their, their partnership. But, you know, there is some evidence that, um, you know, some of this uh, um, has caught the Chinese off guard. Um, you know, the fact that the, it wasn't a cakewalk, that it wasn't over in two or three days. 
it doesn't seem like it's going to end anytime soon. And then the other thing, the you know the um, the, the Western solidarity, which was truly unexpected. I, I mean, the fact that the Germans are for the first time in decades going to meet the uh, you, you know the two percent GDP defense spending minimum. Um, as a result of this, and that the Germans have shut down Nord Stream 2 and have agreed to the SWIFT penalties. And all of that has, has caught China off guard. They, they simply didn't ex anticipate that this sort of unity was possible um, in, among NATO members in the West. And, uh, and then, you know, I also finally want to point out that, uh, you know, the Trans-Siberian Railroad is a major trade corridor between Europe and, um, and uh, East Asia. And, and right now, that is more or less shut down because of reluctance from among Western shipping companies and Chinese shipping companies to ship across Russia. Um, because they're not certain of the, the legality of that, given um, the, uh, the extent of economic sanctions against Russia. Are there any clear indicators as to whether or not the Western economic sanctions are reducing or increasing support of Putin domestically? I wish I could answer that. I, one would imagine yes, but I, I, I'm... I think that's still an open question for me. Yeah, I, I mean, my um, sense here is that you, it, there's going to be two reactions. There's going to be the reaction of young people, you know, people who are 45 and younger in, in the big cities um, who've come of age in this world where Russia is, is integrated, at least economically, in Western structures, where you can walk down to the corner store and buy an iPhone. Um, and you can go on weekend vacations to Tuscany and the Provence. Um, that they, I, I think, will hold Putin responsible for this. Um, but they were always the kind of contingent in Russian politics who were the most uh, um, opposed to Putin. You know, the older people, I, I think, um, you know, who came of age during Soviet period, I, I suspect they're willing to, to tolerate a little bit of discomfort. Um, what sociological consequences can Ukraine anticipate as a result of this conflict, particularly in cities whose borders have been in constant flux with neighboring countries in recent history? Um, I think there's going to be a whole lot of rage and animosity in, um, I mean, this, this is a question about sort of city cities, but, um, any war torn country is going to be pointing fingers. And from my, from my perspective, unlike past uprisings, those fingers aren't going to be pointed at, at the Zelensky regime or at, at the failure of the Ukrainian government. And they're likely to be pointed straight at, at Russia and, and Russian people. I, I've been seeing much more sort of um, anti-Russian uh, sentiment among Ukrainians on the ground. I mean, for, 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 for quite reasonable and reasons, but um, it's, I don't think that's going anywhere, uh, regardless of when this conflict stops. And I'm concerned about that. Dr. Bittner, would you like to add anything? Or well, I mean, sociological consequences, I'm reluctant to, I to speak, that one. That's fine. speak to <laughs> as a historian, yeah. So, um, so uh, I believe that we did address the questions that came in and we're past one. So I, I would really like to thank again, Dr. Baker, Dr. Bittner, thanks so much for your time and providing uh, all of us with this opportunity to learn. Thank you. Thanks um, to everyone. Thank you. There will be a blog post coming out about this in the, as soon as we can get it written up and the link to the recording will be there as well. Um, thanks everybody so much for your attention and um, your concern. Thank you.